Hi everyone, welcome to the Control Listen podcast. This is James Sweetler from Octopark. I have my co-host Joseph Passmer with me today. And we are joined by Jan Richter, the founder of PartsBox. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Great to have you here. Thank you for having me. Anytime. Uh, do you want to just start off by telling people what PartsBox is and what exactly the mission of the company is? Yeah, so, so PartsBox is a um, SaaS uh, business and uh, it's an online application for managing your inventory of electronic components as well as small scale production. So it's basically software that anybody from hobbyists and makers through small businesses and through medium businesses would use for building electronics. Um, you can think of it like um, of, of, of like a small scale ERP system just optimized specifically for electronics, a fairly niche kind of software. Okay. And how long has that been in existence for? How long have you been operating? Uh, nearly eight years now. And uh, the reason why I started PartsBox initially was, was to scratch my own itch, so to speak. I, I, um, I was building electronics and, and uh, I ended up one day ordering some stuff online. And, and when, when, I, when I got the components, I put them in a drawer right next to another set of components that I had ordered a couple of months ago and, 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 and forgotten about. So I figured, okay, I, I need to do something about this, 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 this problem, basically. So I started writing software just to keep track of what I have and, and, and uh, what I'm using for, for builds. And those were small scale prototyping builds. So, so nothing, you know, serious, but, but then I figured, well, um, why not try to actually turn it into a business because it's at the intersection of of two things which I really love. One of them is programming, and the other is electronics. So, so um, I like both things, um, and and I've written this this software which is very useful for me. Why don't I try to to make it um, available to others? And it turned out that actually people really need this kind of software. So uh, here I am, eight years later, uh, pretty happy with 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 the way things are going. That's great. I think it, it's definitely uh, when you ask someone inside the space that you're targeting. And you have that worked experience it's, it gives you a much better understanding of what your users actually need yeah it has helped me a lot <laughs> and people call this dog fooding about using the stuff that you create yourself and and uh, it has helped me uh, immensely uh, i actually don't think you can create specialized niche software without really understanding the niche the niche you're in um, obviously it's always a challenge because i don't know everything about electronics production and i'm still trying to talk to customers and and find out what they do especially at the larger side of the spectrum where i haven't been a lot uh but yeah it has helped immensely From your perspective, what are some of the biggest challenges facing procurement specialists today? Well, obviously, part shortages. <laughs> that, that, that used to be the theme through COVID, and then everybody was fighting for parts and trying to find them online. But, but um, that's, that's kind of the obvious answer. But, but a more longer term look, like as I look back on the perspective of, of the last eight years, is that if you, um, if you manage procurement, you need to figure out what you have, what you need to order, where, where you want to order it from, and then deal with stuff like multiple currencies and uh, changing availability and your preferred distributors and so on. And and you do need tools to manage that. And uh, to this day, I, I meet people who are just fine with using a spreadsheet. And I have no idea how they do it, to be honest, because I think as if you if you create like a bomb spreadsheet with your pricing, I think it's obsolete the minute you close the file. That's it. <laughs> and, and then I have no idea how they deal with multiple currencies, especially for companies in the EU. This is a bit of an issue because you often order from distributors that will ship either in euros or in your local country's currency if, if you if you're not using the euro uh, and obviously US dollars. And then you you need to be on top of that somehow. So um, that's not an easy thing to do. And, 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 and then the issue is that, that you always have something in your inventory. Some of that uh, is so stuff that you've reserved for your projects. So some of that is stuff that you can use for future builds. And what you buy needs to be reconciled with what you have already. So, so that, that's another thing which, which actually Parsbox helps with. And initially, this was the main feature. The, the main idea behind starting this whole thing was to buy only what you need uh, because you often have no idea what you actually have right now. So you, you have no idea what to buy and you, and you end up overbuying, uh, which, which is not a great thing. Uh, but then the other challenge is actually selecting your vendors or distributors. Um, many companies end up buying from just a single distributor because that's the easiest way to go. Uh, obviously, many small companies that manufacture electronics in tiny quantities just buy from Digikey, for example. And that's fine. The Digikey will stock everything that you, you can ever possibly want. Uh, but this might not be the optimal solution looking forward, especially if you go into larger scale production. So, so uh, 
then you end up with the problem, how do you actually uh, select your vendors for all your parts and their substitutes and all the bombs that you're, the projects that you're building. And it turns out that this is not an easy thing to do. So, so again, here, Partsbox tries to help you with, with automating this. So automating the process of vendor selection, so to speak. And, and what you can do is you can define vendor rules, which basically in a programmatic way, you can say, I prefer buying from these distributors unless these guys don't have it, and then move on to the next level. And then there's another list of distributors. And if these guys don't have it, then go here. And that's something you can't easily do with a spreadsheet. And that's something that, that every procurement person who, who does this on a larger scale actually really enjoys using. Yeah. What keeps coming up for me as a, as a theme when you're discussing the functionality of your software is uh, like waste prevention. Um, I know I've, I've heard a lot about this in the industry over the years, but how big of a problem is wastage in uh, electronics industry? Oh, I think it's huge. <laughs> when I talk to customers, I, I, often, uh, I often hear that they will simply buy more than they need for a project or for a build and then discard the rest wow. because it's so much hassle to just keep track of, of what you got, what you have, when you got it, where is it stored, you know, how long the tape is and, and, and is it enough for the next project that they just don't bother. So I, I think there is a lot of waste and, and uh, paradoxically, I think most of it is in the smaller uh, scale production end of the spectrum. Uh, once you get into medium-sized companies, they actually end up using full reels and 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 they take care of of uh, actually pro properly inventorizing their parts and and using all of them. But at the smaller scale, if you're building your prototypes in quantities of ten or or twenty, uh, you might not actually want to bother with it at all. And and uh, I honestly had heard from a a lot of customers who just just, just buy stuff and and drop the parts in a box, once they build, all the leftovers are simply discarded. That's it. Well, except for the really expensive parts, but but most of the stuff gets discarded. So yeah, I, I, I think that's a huge issue. And when you say discarded, what does that mean exactly for someone who doesn't know? The trash can, pretty much. <laughs> okay, so it's literally discarded. Yeah, it's 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 literally, they, 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 they estimate that doing anything with these parts is more costly than just throwing them in the can. That's wow. it. Sometimes they, they don't go in the, directly into the trash can. Sometimes they go into a big box in the company, uh, which, which they never get out of. <laughs> it's basically a forever box. So, so they, <laughs> they drop the parts in and then, and that's it. They, they live up their life in, in there. Um, but, uh, ah, yeah, as I said, you, you, you touch the sensitive issue and I do think it's a, it's a, it's a major problem. And apart from um, overordering and wastage, what other pain points or challenges do you feel that Partsbox is really geared towards solving? Well, Partsbox began as an inventory control solution. So is, initially, that, that's how it was positioned. It was designed to keep track of your parts, what you have and what you can build from. But then um, it turned out that this, this doesn't really solve the, the, the majority of the problems that small companies have. Uh, the problem that they have is they use parts to build. So building is another huge part of, of, of the whole solution. So I think over the years, Partsbox moved much more to the building side. And that's where you enter um, the world of manufacturing and, and keywords like MRP, manufacturing resource processes or, 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 or things like that. I'm not really sure what, what, what to call the solution, to be honest. But uh, these days, I think... Um, my customers, especially those on the higher plans, they mostly focus on production. So inventory is kind of like an addition and it's become kind of like a generic feature that pretty much everyone on the market has. Uh, but inventory coupled with your production and then uh, configuring your builds so that you know exactly which parts were used and which builds and you get traceability, for example, and you get a history of your builds and you can track your bills, for example, the serial number of this device, you can know exactly which parts went in, went into it, from which orders, from which distributors. That's where a lot of value is. So I, I, I think I'm helping solve a lot of challenges there. Um, the, of the obvious problem there is, is that all this building stuff is complex. So it's very difficult to explain. The marketing of this is, is obviously terribly difficult because you, it's, it's you cannot just simply in one sentence say what, what this software does. Um, but, but I think it helps a lot. But um, you mentioned challenges. I can, I can tell you some of the challenges that I share with my customers. 
Mm-hmm. And and they are actually sometimes kind of amusing. So one major challenge is barcodes. When you get those little bags from distributors, uh, they usually have barcodes, 2D barcodes on them, sometimes 2D barcodes, sometimes 1D barcodes. And the obvious thing, if you have an inventory solution, would be to pick up a handheld scanner or show it to your to your computer's camera and and have things happen automatically. Well, I would love to do that. But the problem is that these barcodes, they are not standardized. Every distributor does something of his own. Mm-hmm. And we end up with, with with basically a huge mess. So so I'm, I'm I try to work with distributors and tell them what what the problems are in their barcodes and how how to fix them and how to improve them. But it's a long process, and I would love for these to get better. Uh, the ideal scenario, actually, which is already possible with some distributors, notably DigiKey, is that you can if you place your order from within parts box, you prepare your list of parts to order, and you basically you need to do this using copy paste today. Uh, but but if you do that, you copy the parts with special ID codes, okay. and then you order that. And Partsbox remembers those ID codes. So when the parts arrive, actually, DigiKey prints these barcodes on demand, and they include the little codes that Partsbox generated. Mm. So when you get the parts, it's uh, you just scan them, and Partsbox knows exactly which order this belongs to. So it knows which part it is and which order it was, what, what it's supposed to, where it's supposed to go, and, and, and so on. And this makes it extremely convenient to receive parts. Yeah. So there is some progress there, but that is not common across distributors. Um, and a problem which is kind of related is that um, people would like to print labels. If you move your parts elsewhere, you would like to print a label. Um, that would have a QR code and it would be readable with a scanner again. And then you can ease, easier manage your parts and 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 quickly do go through a pick list, for example. And the problem there is that Partsbox lives in a browser. And it's a silly technical limitation, but actually printing stuff to barcode printers from a browser <laughs> is really complicated. And if you don't want it to be a support nightmare, uh, you basically need to come up with a fancy solution, which I haven't been able to do over the years. So I'm still hoping to solve that and have easy barcodes barcoded label printing available from within the software. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that people would love uh, having that. Is it a possibility of uh, heading towards eventually a mobile app type thing that can be used to the, attached to a printer and go around as you as you uh, do inventory? Or Yeah, so I looked at many solutions. The problem there is, the, well, the problem with mobile apps is cost. That's actually one of the reasons people often ask me, why, why is Partsbox implemented as a subscription-based online app? And uh, the usual reaction is, I don't want an online app. I just want something running on my computer. And 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 the answer is that well, for, well, first of all, if you're using it yourself, you you you'll be fine with your computer. But if you're in a company and sharing the data with several people, mm-hmm. and 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 collaborating, you need something that you know updates your stock in real time. Otherwise, you 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 you'll never be able to manage your production. So that that that's one part of the answer. But the other part is actually, um, from a business standpoint, it's very difficult to. Um, it's costly, first of all, to build apps. So mm-hmm. if I were to build a mobile app and, and perhaps a dedicated app for Mac OS, another one for Windows, another one for Linux, that's a huge cost. And I can't really transfer that cost onto my customers because there's a limit to how much small businesses are willing to pay for inventory control yeah. and production control. Uh, so basically, it doesn't make sense from a business standpoint. So the best I've, I've managed to do is to try to make parts books run anywhere. On a phone, on on a tablet. Uh, mm-hmm. So, for example, you can you can take a little tablet with a camera, and you can scan those labels somewhere, and and uh, the thing will work. Okay, so 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 the online yeah. software is capable of using the camera and scanning the barcodes and recognizing them, and 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 working just as a desktop app. So I'm kind of trying to get there, but but dedicated apps are a difficult problem, and I don't think they're achievable at these price points. That makes total sense. Um, as far as AI and automation goes. Obviously, you're using some stuff here that's pulling all this data constantly. Um, how crucial is is that in the, the operation of the software? Do you mean AI in, as in large language models and the modern yes. wave of AI? Yeah. So um, AI is being used in Parsbox right now for several things, but I'm trying to keep it away from the main workflow of, of my customers. And the reason okay. for that is that, that the the current generation of, of models are not reliable enough to be used in production environments, basically, and and mistakes are too costly. So so um, I think it'll take a while until we get to, to models that we can really rely on and that we can expect not to hallucinate, not to generate fake answers, not to make mistakes and so on. Or maybe we won't, but I really have no idea because we, we, we tend to say that we want to have AI that is human level 
well, humans make mistakes. So <laughs> perhaps if we get to human level, <laughs> it will be obvious that mistakes must be there as well. I really don't know. <laughs> so for the moment, AI is there, but it's it's used for things like generating descriptions, abbreviations, summarizing data, uh, translations, things like that. Not not necessarily the main workflows of customers. And I don't really see a good way to fit it there until it becomes more reliable. But, but uh, well, I'm trying to stay on, on top of things and working with all the AI companies all the time, uh, trying to basically keep up and, and see what's there and what the models are capable of. But I think, well, expanding on that answer, I think uh, you mentioned AI and data. And, and I would say that data for the moment is, is a much larger focus for me than, 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 than AI, uh, which is, by the way, why I'm working with, with Nexar and, and have been working with Octopath from the very beginning uh, as a reliable source of data. Uh, because the more data you have about your parts, the better decisions you can make when ordering and when building. And that, that helps a lot. Yeah, and uh, just to touch on that, you mentioned before we were actually recording that uh, Joseph kind of asked, how has it impacted your customers switching to the API? And you said it didn't. So yeah, really happy to hear that, that it was that smooth of a transition. Yeah, yeah. So the transition was from the older uh, API used by Octopart back in the day, because um, like I said, I started the business eight years ago and 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 that was the time of, of Octopart and, and the old API. And then I switched over to the new Nexar GraphQL based API. And and my customers never noticed, which is the way I like it. <laughs> That's exactly mm -hmm. what I what I want to achieve. I, my customers, I mean, I have a very simple business relationship. My customers pay me money because I make their workflows easier, um, and and they don't care about about anything else, and they shouldn't. So mm -hmm. so I was very happy about that. And uh, yeah, the 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 new API it didn't change things uh, significantly um, in terms of semantics, but but uh, and in terms of technology, it's just as reliable as the old one. So so uh, perfect. Great. Do you see any emerging technologies or approaches that will shape the next generation of inventory management practices? Uh, not really, because uh, people keep asking me if I'm afraid of AI, for example, going back to the theme of AI. Mm -hmm. And people keep telling me that AI will you know, kick me out of business basically because because it will just manage the inventory. Um, I don't think it will anytime soon, uh, and I think my job is fairly secure for the next at least ten years or so. But but we'll, we'll we'll see about that. But I think the biggest the biggest progress that we can make in the electronics world is actually not by using any fancy technology. It's by uh, trying to work together and establishing some organizations for 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 better cooperation. You know, ju ju just to quickly mention, I think. The biggest problems that we're facing in electronics are not technical, but they are, for example, identifying parts. Uh, how do you know if two parts are the same part? What is a part, really? Uh, people tend to think it's, oh, a part is, is described by an MPN, manufacturer part number. Well, that's not really true because that, that's not unique. So then people say, okay, well, an MPN plus the manufacturer name, that, that uniquely identifies a part. Well, it doesn't for, for, for a couple of reasons, one of which is that manufacturers have no idea how they're called and they keep changing their names and, and acquiring one another, you know, getting into this huge blob of one single company that we'll eventually end up with. But, but that, and, and, and that's just part of the problem. Then, then you run into issues like, for example, you have, you have a part which is, well, let, let's, let's take an example that I know, a TPS402010 from Texas Instruments. It exists in DRCR, DRCT, and DRCRG4 versions, for example. And the difference between those, I mean, two of these differ because they have silver on, on, on their pins, an addition of silver. But one of them is just a different packaging. Instead of real, you get it on tape. So technically, the part that's on there, it's, it's the same part from a design standpoint. It's a different part from, from a manufacturing standpoint or from a purchasing standpoint. But then, you know, distributors make, make this even more difficult because, for example, DigiKey, they will take the real part and they will cut it into strips of cut tape for you if you want. So you're buying the R part, thinking it's on a reel, or you know it's it's labeled as a reel, but you and you might end up with cut tape, uh, which is supposed to be the T part. So all in all, it's a big mess, and and solving this is it, there, there's no technology needed. Uh, the, the, there's just hard thinking and 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 design uh, needed to to define what is a part for certain purposes for for you know initial design purposes, then for, for manufacturing, for for certification and compliance, and having some convention of 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 uh, transmitting that to the customer, so to speak. Uh, 
let me give you an example of, of, of a world which has which has actually, or perhaps not solved it, but but at least addressed it. <laughs> it's basically if you look at any other industry, for example, the food industry, uh, you have the GS1 organization, which 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 manages issuing of, of codes and code prefixes so that you can code every product with with a unique prefix, which is your company's prefix, and then a number for your product. And you can put it out into the world and it will end up in a supermarket and somebody at the cash register will scan it and it'll work. This will be a unique code which will uniquely identify this this can of tuna, for example. Uh, so the EAN codes are a subset of the GS1 codes right now, um, and and it, it it works for the food industry and it works very well. We don't have anything like that in the electronics industry. What 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 we use is a mishmash of various methods, and even the barcodes that we use are not standardized. Like I said, everybody runs with something of their own. And some of these technologies are kind of bizarre based on military specs from, from years ago. So so it's kind of weird. And I think there is a lot of work that could be done there. Um, I also think we could do a lot of work with data standardization. So for example, lifecycle status for parts. There's, there's no way to get this information in a machine readable, machine processable form right now. Um, and I know that Nexar makes a big effort to, to, to actually actually provide something. Uh, so as a customer, I do get something for every part I, I, or for some parts, I will get a note about the life cycle status, but this note will, the meaning of that will differ per manufacturer. It might be, you know, end of life, or it might be not recommended for new designs, or it might be any other description that the manufacturer put in there. It's, it's not something that I can machine process. And I think a lot could be done there, and, but that would require cooperation with the manufacturers, obviously, because they would need to put out the data. They Ultimately, they have it. <laughs> so so um, my hope is actually that Nexar, um, you know, as, 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 as you guys are leading the industry, that the, 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 the Nexar will actually force manufacturers to, or work with them, to, to get data in a more reliable and predictable format. And I think that would go a long way towards making everyone's life easier. Um, to, to again, to give you an example, like what customers need is that if they have a project, a bomb that, that, that they've been building for a couple of years now, they need notifications about which parts might, might you know, there might be a last buy status, for example. And they need to, the, the, they would like to know about this automatically. And there is, there is no way to do this automatically across the entire industry. You can do this for individual manufacturers with a major effort, but you cannot just, you know, for any part that you have in your bomb, give me a notification if the part is, is nearing its end of life. Um, so, yeah, so, so I think a lot of work can be done there. And also, um, even on the, um, on the data side, the way we are describing parts today, uh, Nexar has specs, which are fantastic. Those attributes of parts where you can read, you know, capacitance or uh, the parameters of your MOSFETs. And that is a great, that, that's actually a huge effort to, to gather all this data in a standardized format and then process it and, 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 and serve it. But uh, it doesn't go quite far enough. There is still a lot more to be done. So for example, we still have no unified taxonomic or category system for parts. What is, is this part a resistor or is it an inductor? And, and uh, Nexar does have categories, but this is not a unified system across the industry again. And I think we could come up with something that would work. Nothing will be perfect, obviously, because there are always questions. If it, is a resistor ladder a resistor or not? Um, well, it, it, I guess it depends. But uh, something would be better than nothing. And then what would really help would, for each category of parts, a set of like key specs, which are common to all of these parts. So we know that resistors will have, you know, for example, resistance and power, and possibly possibly breakdown voltage, and 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 for MOSFETs you will have VDS and RDS on, for example, and for BGTs you will you have HFE and and and, and something else, and and that would make life for people so much easier because when they search for parts they would they would be able to filter by those key specs, instead of looking like at, at every possible spec for every possible electronic part in a big jumble, so. Um, Going back to your question, I, I think we can do a lot without any new technologies, ju just by you know trying to work together. Altium 365 lets you hold the fastest design reviews ever. Share your designs from anywhere and with anyone with a single click. It's easy. Leave a comment tagging your teammate and they'll instantly receive an email with a link to the design. Anyone you invite can open the design using a web browser. Using the browser interface, you're able to comment, mark up, cross probe, inspect, and more. Comments are attached directly to the project, making them viewable within Altium Designer, as well as through the browser interface. Give it a try and get started with Altium 365 today.
And I wanted to ask as well. So obviously pre-COVID and post-COVID, we had to switch from just in time to just in case. How has that sort of affected the way that people actually treat their inventories? Well, first of all, inventories have grown hugely. <laughs> so I think I think that, that when, when when COVID struck and we we, we started feeling the waves of of, of uh, inventory issues, people started overbuying. Whenever they were able to buy parts, they would overbuy, and mm -hmm. when they would order parts with, with with huge lead times, they would again they would overbuy because they they weren't sure if they, they would be able to buy them again. Um, so what we ended up with with uh, right now is 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 huge inventories. Uh, and initially, to be honest, I, I, I thought that companies would want to get rid of those inventories very soon, but that 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 doesn't seem to be happening. <laughs> I, I, I think people got burned by COVID very badly and, and by those inventory issues. And I think many companies hold on to those uh, large inventories right now just in case something happens <laughs> because because you really have no idea. Um, so I, 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 I don't check the statistics on, on my customers' inventories that often, but, um, uh, uh, the last time I, I looked the, the sheer amount, you know, monetary amount mm -hmm. that was in the inventories was, was huge. It was much okay. larger than before. Do you see that continuing or do you see that changing eventually when people kind of get over the initial shock of COVID? To be honest, I have no idea. <laughs> I I did have some predictions, you know, when COVID struck, I, I, I did have some predictions for the future and all of them turned out to be wrong about <laughs> economic downturns and so on. So so at this point, I, I, I learned to basically expect anything. So I really have no idea. Um, I can give you on, on that, on a related note, I can give you one interesting data point I just remembered. Um, hmm. There are many electronic parts worldwide, but there is a constant number of parts of unique parts that are actually used <laughs> and oh. that number is 250,000 and it has stayed remarkably constant over the years so if you look at the entire market for electronics only about 250,000 unique parts are ones which are actually used at least you know on that end of the small scale production that that I operate in and I found that interesting because I, I expected the number to be much higher I expected it to be in the millions somewhere uh, but it isn't, and and it stays remarkably constant. Uh, so that's that's actually pretty amazing, and it also means that the work with with uh, you know getting data for these parts is not as large as we think. Two hundred fifty thousand parts. That's pretty much manageable. Yeah, would that kind of stay pretty constant? Because as ones become obsolete, new ones come in, and they kind of just replace each other. So it stays around that same number. Yeah, I think actually the churn of, of parts becoming obsolete is a, is is really a minor thing that that's barely noticeable. Okay, um, it's just that that customers end up using pretty much the same parts. So so those oh, okay. two hundred fifty thousand are the common parts that pretty much everybody uses. Um, and and uh, yeah, I found that pretty interesting. I also recently did some work on statistics and tried to gather stats on which which are, which parts are the most popular in, in a business setting, and then for hobbies. And that was also fairly enlightening, and, and I was I was kind of surprised at the results. Uh, basically, the, the the discrepancy between the two tables is is complete. I mean, they're completely different. Uh, what what businesses use and what 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 hobbyists use, even those even though those are small scale businesses, so so those are not the Samsungs of the world. Uh, and and then the other big surprise for me was that the can you guess the most popular part among hobbyists? No, I could, I couldn't. Okay. I, I, well, if, if you take out the resistors and capacitors, because these are boring. So, so I just, I just, I just, I just forgot about them. The most popular part among hobbies is still the venerable NE555 timer. And I was kind of amazed because I thought that in the age of microcontrollers and Arduinos and all the new technologies, people would not blink their LEDs using the NE555 timer from Texas Instruments, but they still do. <laughs> so it's the absolute number one part. And if you look at the top 20 chart, there are three variants of that chip, you know, in the in the top 20. Wow. So people still begin their electronics journey uh, with the NE555 timer, just as they did, I don't know, 30 or 40 years ago. Pretty amazing. That's interesting. So it stood the test of time. Yeah, it does. Very much does. That's interesting. The, the, the number of unique parts being regularly used is an interesting indicator. I wonder, I wonder if it would be possible to look at that, you know, from a, a hundred or two hundred years ago, like how many, how many parts are being regularly used in the age of, of steam and, and before if it, what that growth looks like. Yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess people used more bespoke parts before. And right now it's more off the shelf parts. So, so I guess, I guess it's, it wouldn't be a fair comparison, but 
uh, yeah, I, I, I still find the number interesting, and I find it interesting that it doesn't really grow over the years. I mean, barely yeah. grows. It's like like the difference from between two hundred forty and two hundred fifty thousand over over two years. Very minor. Wow. And do you have uh, any upcoming or planned features or functions for Parts Box? To helping helping customers take control of of inventory, BOM pricing, or production. Yeah, so so there are always plans. It's, it's just a matter of when I'm actually able to 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 make things happen and and to implement all the features that I would like to to see happen. So so the biggest upcoming thing is actually related to to Nexar specs. Um, I really want to make use of all the data that I'm getting as attributes for parts and. Uh, what you will be able to do is you will be able to implement custom filters for basically every place in parts box. So any table that you see in parts box, whether it be a table of parts, parts in a storage location, or your 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 lots for for companies who use lot control, or your builds when you're selecting parts, any any table anywhere, you'll be able to filter by any spec that I get from Nexer. So why is this useful? Well, for example, if you're looking for uh, what capacitors do I have in my inventory that uh, have the X5R dielectric and are between 10 and 22 microfarads? You'll be able to do that quickly using those filters. And and they work for any specs from, from again, from any spec from, from, from Nexar for any part. So it's not something that I need to implement for each spec separately. And I think this will be a fairly big deal. Uh, these are not very easy to use because you do need, do need to look at the, the logic of how to, how to combine those filters and you can combine them arbitrarily. But I think it's a very powerful thing that makes working with both your inventory and your builds uh, much, much easier. So I think that'll make life easier for, for everyone. Um, in the longer term, um, there are two, two, two threads that I'm pursuing. Um, basically, um, you might recall that I have two groups of users. I have business users and hobby users. And these are completely separate groups. There's the, the hobby users, they get parts box for free. There is no expectations that they will ever pay. So it's not like a freemium offering where, where they are expected to upgrade to something in the future. They're not, <laughs> okay? It's supposed to be free for hobbyists. Also because I was a hobbyist myself and I, I remember how uh, how nice it is to, to, get, to get a tool like that for free. So, um, so they're getting um, all the free stuff. And I do hope to get label printing implemented for everyone, including hobbyists. And I think that would make life for people much, much easier when you can label your storage locations uh, like boxes or shelves, and you can label your bags with your parts and then scan them and quickly retrieve those parts. So so that that's one thing with the, that'll help everyone. On the business side, uh, I need to expand the manufacturing features uh, by including more planning. Right now, the purchasing is fairly extensive and it makes use of Nexar data for, for um, current availability and pricing information. But uh, planning is, is, is something that is fairly basic. And what, what companies want to do is they want to reserve or purchase specific batches of parts. And those batches are supposed to be dedicated to certain bills. So in a way, they want to plan the bills and then allocate the, the orders directly towards bills so that they aren't used for anything else. Mm -hmm. And that's something which, which, which I've been working uh, on for quite a while. And I expect to finish it sometime this year. And I think this will make the software much more mature and much more useful, again, for, for, for businesses who do this sort of planning and build something on a fairly, not on a completely small scale, but, but on a slightly larger scale. Again, this is not for the LGs and Samsungs of the world. This is for the companies that, 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 that produce in, well, let's say hundreds or thousands of units, perhaps tens of thousands, but, but that's those kinds of quantities. So we'll see how this goes. Um, the, usually new features are implemented fairly slowly because um, I, I design them myself. I ask my customers how they work. I try to understand how they work. Then I try to design it the way that I would like the software to be implemented for me, uh, something that I would want to use. Uh, I never look at other software um, for, for many reasons. And one of them is that usually most other solutions that I've looked at in the past, they got things wrong. And I don't want to copy their mistakes. So I usually try to look at the actual problem the customer has and then figure out, okay, well, how would I solve this for myself? And that takes a long time. <laughs> so I usually come up with uh, several designs which are, which are flawed. And then eventually with something that kind of works, and then sometimes I need to scrap that and rewrite it from scratch again. But but that's how Partsbox has been developed so far, and that's how I intend to continue it. So I would say, yeah, production planning would be the major feature that will be coming up um, over the next year. Great. Exciting. Um, one last question for you before we uh, wrap things up. 
What are some uh, trends that you've been interested by or that you've seen appearing in recent years in the tech industry that people should keep an eye on? I really, I really wouldn't, wouldn't know, <laughs> to be honest. I look at trends. Well, let me give you a longer answer. Um, mm -hmm. It turns out that I ended up, by, by implementing the sort of software that I work on, I ended up being a fairly conservative software guy by the, the, at this point. Uh, I look at trends and technologies and I try things out, and but they need to be really good and really reliable and really, you know, improve everything vastly in order for me to be interesting. So many things that I see, I consider them as fads or fashions uh, because they do not significantly move the needle for me. And again, this is because I ended up living in a very, what people would call a very boring part of the software world, writing enterprise resource planning software. But, but, uh, but I kind of like it, and and it gives me a specific focus. And and again, I I get paid by my customers for making their their lives easier. <laughs> I don't get paid for implementing flashy technology. So this is a very unique point of view, and uh, in a way, it limits me somewhat. Um, but um, it it works much better for my customers in the end. So so this is roughly where I am. So you know, go, going back to your question, I see a lot of things which, which look meaningful or interesting, but they are not interesting specifically for parts box. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I tend to avoid them. Um, and that, that especially includes new software technologies and, and new software development technologies. Um, perhaps some of them will become good or reliable or, or gain major adoption in a couple of years, and then they will be interesting. But for the moment, they're not. The one big trend which has been emerging are those large, large language models. Um, mm -hmm. And they are indeed interesting. They begin to be interesting for a growing number of applications. But like I said, the, the number of applications are still limited. It's still limited. And you need to be very careful about where to use these, uh, where you use these models and whether they introduce errors into your data. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing that's interesting is there's no sort of groundwork laid uh, about where accountability, accountability lies if the software messes up, whether it's the company's fault or not. Uh, I don't know if you saw that lawsuit uh, with, I think it was Canada Airlines, where, oh, yeah, yeah that, that's, inter that's really interesting to me to see how a court actually found in that case. Yeah, but I think it's very clear cut. Uh, I mean, from, I from so. my point of view, if I, if I present anything to my customers, I'm, I'm responsible. <laughs> it doesn't matter if I outsource it to an AI or not. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm trying not to do silly things like outsource important things to, to those large, large language models uh, because they're essentially text generators at this point. Very smart text generators, but still, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're supposed to, to basically hallucinate text. And sometimes it's, it's, it's meaningful, sometimes it's not. So, so ultimately, I am responsible. Again, I, I have a direct relationship with the customers, so, so I, cannot, I cannot use something that I, that I don't feel comfortable with, with, with using. And that's why, that's why the AIs are, are used, but in a very limited scope and, and, and very carefully. Um, yeah. yeah. I think that's fair. <laughs> well, thank you. Actually, before we wrap up, last thing is if people want to actually check out your software, um, what is the best place to do that? Partsbox.com is the place to go. And then uh, that's where you will find the software and the li admittedly limited documentation. And you can, uh, you can sign up for a trial. Uh, it's free. You don't even need a credit card. You can just start using it. If you're a hobbyist, you can just sign up for a free account and, and use it for free forever. The only requirement there is that you log in every, once every couple of years because uh, it does cost me to, to maintain the databases. So, so th there is that one requirement, but otherwise it is and will be free for hobbyists. So, all the hobbyists are welcome, and for businesses, you know, you can you can just try it out, see if it works for you. Um, it's not something that works for everyone. Some of the decisions that that were made are fairly opinionated, but perhaps it, it might work for you. Yeah. So partsbox.com. Great. And if you want to just keep up with updates, uh, LinkedIn is the best place. Yeah, probably LinkedIn. Although to be honest, I, I haven't been great with posting updates. I do intend to be better in the future. Uh, there is also a Partsbox blog, of a, which is linked from the uh, homepage for Partsbox, and I do try to post some stuff in there. and And customers can also um, receive email updates about new features. Although to be honest, these days most people just turn everything off related to emailing because they think they will get spammed every every week. Uh, well, Partsbox sends an email every quarter at best. <laughs> so, so you will never get spam, but you will get some decent information about what, what, what has been newly implemented. So those would be the key places, I guess. Yeah. LinkedIn and, and, and the parts was blog. Great. 
Well, thank you so much for coming on. It was actually really fascinating talking to you. Some, uh, some great points you raised. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Anytime. That was really interesting. I really enjoyed yeah. it. Thank and you. Uh, for anyone listening at home, just come back next week and we will have another guest for you. Mm-hmm.